Stitch Knits. This is a vlog style podcast coming to you from Sacramento, California, where I chat about all the things that I have been making. Mostly knitting, but also spinning, weaving, dyeing, and sewing. My name's Jillian, but you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Good Witch Knits. And thank you so much for taking some time out of your day today to play show and tell. If this is your first time checking out one of these podcasts, congratulations. They're really fun. Um, makers show off things that they have finished making or are working on, and you get to follow along with our progress. I have quite a bit to show you today because, as you may have noticed, I took a little break. Uh, my husband and I recently celebrated our fifth year wedding anniversary and took a nearly three week trip to Japan. Um, so yeah, that helps explain the hiatus. I really wanted to get a podcast done before we left, but um, some crafting got in the way. Let's jump right into what I'm wearing. So up top, I'm wearing my completed Agnes sweater. This is a finished object. The Agnes sweater, it's a sweater that was re released about five years ago uh, by Quince and Company. I will put a link to my Ravelry project page down in the description below. The Agnes sweater is a very simple top-down, in-the-round raglan, and I made mine out of a Barocco yarn called Regatta. Regatta is 100% cotton, but it's kind of an interesting yarn. It almost looks like the selvage edge of fabric. Let's see if it'll focus on that. I'll do the YouTuber thing. And I knit mine out of this really interesting black and white marled yarn. And I love it. A few modifications I made to the pattern. It has pockets in it, but I omitted those. Stand up and see if you can see them. And I cropped off about an inch of the sweater as well. And I made the sleeves three quarters. So I call this a finished object, but I'm not sure if I'm done. And maybe you can give me some feedback in the comments. First off, the color's cool, but I can't help but wonder what it would look like if I dyed it. The very white parts of the sweater probably look really cool dyed and contrasting against the black in it. Um, the other thing I'm not sure about is the three-quarter length sleeve. I have nearly a whole ball of this Vergata yarn left, and I'll still have some left after lengthening the sleeves, but because I have so much left, I just barely broke into this to finish my right sleeve. I'm curious, maybe I should actually make them full length? Because I honestly don't know what else I would do with just one ball of this yarn. Um, yeah, what do you think I should do? Or do you have something you could do with this ball of yarn? Let me know, I'll give it to you, uh, especially if you're going to be at Stitches West this year. Stitches is coming up. It's a yarn convention in Santa Clara, I think that's where it is, California. I live in Sacramento, so it's pretty close. I'll be there on Saturday and Sunday. Let me know, are you going to be at Stitches? Leave a comment below, we should definitely meet up and talk about all of the yarny things. But yeah, if you <laughs> want this ball of yarn, let me know, and I'll give it to you there. You can work out a fun little, a fun little trade. I think that's all I have to say about the sweater. Uh, one other modification I made, don't know if I mentioned it yet, I added some short rows to the back. I think I added three in total. I will leave a link to, I think it's a Susan Anderson tutorial on how to add short rows to the back of a sweater. The reason I did that is there's no real shaping in it and I wanted the front of the sweater to drop down a little bit more than the back. So adding a few short rows in the back just brought the back up a little bit. I did make one other modification. Uh, Tommy of Squirrel Pie Productions recently made, I think it was a sweater for her kid. and She added a little loop, a little bit of yarn to the back of the sweater, sort of in place of a tag to show where the back of the sweater was, so I added that to this too. Awesome pro tip there. 
moving right along because I have a lot of finished objects to show you. I'm not going to get through them all. Uh, I'm wearing another one. It is, it's going to be very hard to show you. Let's see if I can run around to the back here. Ah, I can't. So this is a uh, hacked Grainline Studio Willow tank. So it's actually a whole dress. Um, I'm not gonna flash you right now, but I'll insert a few pictures of what the dress looks like. I usually wear it with a sweater over the top, so this is a pretty typical way to see me wearing it. I will also include a tutorial that I use to hack this willow tank. Um, essentially you just measure the width of the tank top in this pattern and create a gathered skirt that you sew onto the bottom. I also added pockets to mine and they were added successfully. It's my first time adding in pockets to a garment that didn't already have them. So I'm pretty proud of that. The material that this dress is made out of. I'll come back a little closer to make sure you can hear me. I made this dress out of hemp. I found the suiting section at High Fashion Studio, which is, or at High Fashion Fabric, which is really my local fabric store here in Sacramento. Um, and, oh my gosh, suiting fabric's amazing in the woven section and also the knits. I've been kind of disappointed with how hard it is to source good natural fibers. The suiting section's full of them. Um, cotton wool blends, linen wool blends, it's really cool, but then I found this 100% oh, flash me there, but this 100% hemp suiting fabric. And I talked to someone who does the purchasing there, and yeah, she was really excited about it too, but apparently this color didn't really sell because people mostly buy it to make suits, I guess? I don't know a ton about fabric, but, or what people use suiting fabrics for. I love it, worked into this dress. I bought a bunch of it when I found it because I was just so excited. And plan to probably make some pants with it. Hemp's really cool because I think a lot of people think of hemp and um, think of it being in fashion that a lot of people who are advocates of cannabis wear, and I guess historically that's been primarily the people that wear it, because hemp's been really regulated in the United States, probably other countries as well, it's been hard to access it, and some of those laws are liberal liberalizing, which is cool, because hemp is a really sustainable fiber to produce, and it performs so well. I wore this dress truly every single day I was in Japan. And this may be TMI, but I haven't washed it since I made it. And I should because hemp is just going to soften over time, much the way linen does, but it doesn't smell at all. And I know I am, like, I'm perfect and I don't sweat and I don't smell. No, not true. Uh, Sometimes I smell really bad, but this fabric has not retained any of the smell. It smells amazing, and I know it's not just me not smelling it. I have had other people smell my dress, because I can't believe that I've worn this dress so many days in a row. And it has just held up so well. So go find some hemp fabric, make yourself a hemp garment, it's amazing. I've never knit with hemp. I'm very curious what that would be like. Have you knit with hemp? Let me know. As you saw when I was standing back there, there's a lot of volume to this dress. I added quite a bit of fabric to the skirt. I might rip it out and make it a little bit less voluminous. Still haven't decided quite yet. There's a lot of other things that I want to sew. So that project might get moved to the back burner since this dress is serving its function and I'm really excited for it to transition from winter time because it actually really kept me warm in Tokyo to the summer where hopefully it's going to breathe the way hemp should. All right, moving along, my cat has decided to make an appearance. 
Hi, Bosby. Moving along to other finished objects. This is the Best Beret by James N. Watts. Knit up in, um, it was the Christmas color from the Granui Co. Advent calendar, her lunar advent calendar from last year. And there's a little story about this project. It was my travel project <laughs> for going to Japan, but it did not start off as this project. So I really didn't know what I wanted to knit while I was traveling in Japan. If you've been following along at all, I was trying to finish all of my works in progress before the new year, and I did it. I didn't have to frog anything, because anything that I didn't finish, I was going to frog. So what this left was kind of a void. I didn't know what projects to cast on next, because all of the projects I'm really excited about right now are these large, complicated sweater patterns, and that's just not travel knitting, especially because Eric and I traveled with like one carry-on suitcase. Very minimal. While knitting is a priority for me, I couldn't make my whole carry-on a giant colorwork sweater pattern. So what I did was I grabbed this yarn, which I guess is now with this hat on my head, the Granuico Christmas colorway from her Lunar Advent calendar last year. I've been wanting to make something out of that. If anything, socks would be nice in it, but it was so pretty, a hat would be great to show it off. And I also grabbed this um, black market wool in the color Oxblood. This yarn is dyed by my friend Rigel. Yes, I grabbed those two yarns that I loved and excited me and figured, okay, inspiration will strike and I'll make something. Because you definitely need knitting on a 12-hour flight across the Pacific Ocean. This hat started off as an Olmsted hat. The Olmsted hat is a pattern designed by Jacqueline Salem of the Brooklyn Knit Folk podcast. And I cast on and essentially finished that hat on my flight to Japan. Um, and it was too big. And Jacqueline's actually talked about this in a recent podcast that she released. She knit another Olmsted hat recently and it was too big for her boyfriend. So if you are going to make that hat, I would encourage you to go down by 10 to 20 stitches even from the cast on. It's a broken rib so it's very easy to modify the pattern. Um, so that was kind of a bummer, but it was also a blessing in disguise because once I got to Tokyo, we're walking around. Everyone there was wearing berets. Like, seriously, all of the cute women walking around. They're wearing these like, big dresses, oversized dresses, with oversized sweaters, and berets. And they looked so cute! I'm thinking, cool, I already have the oversized dress and the sweater. Like, this is my style. I love it. I want to be a part of the Cool Beret Club. And I've been wanting to make this pattern for a while. So I frogged the hat because it didn't fit me and doesn't. I don't think it was going to fit anyone. And I knit up this hat. The only downside to it, I, I got the right measurement for the, it has an I-cord band around your head. Yeah, you're going to see it even right now. I knit the adult large, and it is 16 inches around, but it always leaves a mark on my forehead. I used to wear berets a bunch in college, because I was weird, and that didn't really happen to me. Have you made this pattern? Do you get the line on your head? It's the only thing that's keeping me from wearing it, because if I do decide to wear it, I kind of have to commit to wearing it for the whole day, or else I get the line. So this is designed for, I think, a worsted weight yarn. And I held two strands of fingering weight yarn together. I still have the same gauge. I think the fabric might be a little bit less dense than what 
James was going for, but I think it still holds its structure pretty well. I love this hat. I love wearing it with a black turtleneck and feeling like a speckled beet person. It's fun. I recommend making the hat. Let me know if you get a line on your head when you make it. I think that might be it for all of my finished objects. Let me check my notes because I had so many things to talk about. Oh wait, I do have one more thing that I finished and I'm not going to model it for you, but I will post a picture of <laughs> it done. It's another sewing finish object. I made a bathing suit. Check this out. This is the Seabright Swimmer by, Fri bleh, by Friday Pattern Company, run by Chelsea, who's actually local and part of my knitting group, Nickel. This uh, swimsuit pattern was actually my first time sewing with knits at all and my first time sewing like a stretchy stretchy fabric and I sewed it one night in one go when I couldn't sleep I think it probably took me in total five hours sewing stretchy fabrics is not hard you guys um, and it actually holds up in the ocean. I wore it in Hawaii. Yes, on the way back from Japan, Eric and I stopped for a few days in Hawaii to help deal with the jet lag. But don't feel too jealous because I caught the flu my last day in Japan and I was just like totally sick the whole time in Hawaii. My poor husband, but I still had fun. Hawaii is a great place to be sick if you have to be sick anywhere. <laughs> still managed to make it out to the beach on our last day there and modeled the swimming suit, tested it out. Didn't make any modifications to it. I knit the second size up and I loved it. So my goal in sewing was to get to the point where I could make myself a bathing suit and now I'm here. So I guess the next goal will be to just make all of my own clothes and not buy anything this year. Yeah, that's it. Those are everything that I'm going to show you today that I have finished. And I don't have a bunch of works in progress. Let me show you something that's been getting a lot of attention right now. Living in my home row Fiberco bag is my interval shawl. The interval shawl is a pattern by Brooklyn Tweed, Jared Flood, and it's a part of their new beginner series. I don't know if you've knit a Brooklyn Tweed pattern before. They're incredibly written. They're very detailed. They'll often be 16 to 20 pages, either because they offer both um, men and women sizing or because they have you gauge swatch every part of the pattern. This pattern is only four pages long and is designed as really a first pattern project. It's kind of funny to me though because even with it being a first project, they still have you do a provisional cast on. But, you know, it's, it's not too hard. I'm knitting this out of Arbor. It's a DK weight woolen spun yarn by Brooklyn Tweed and I'm knitting it in the color Norway and it's so wonderfully springy. This yarn is just, I want to make everything out of this yarn. It's incredible. And I'm knitting it also because I have a class coming up at Rumpelstiltskin. It's a knit your first project from a pattern class we're knitting either this interval shawl, pull it up for you, it's what it looks like when it's done, or a hat, and the hat is recommended to make out of uh, Peary. So I'm knitting the sample up for the store, and it's knitting up so fast. I cast this on on, I think, Friday, it's now Monday. Hope to, I'll have it done by the next time we sit down and chat. 
and I love this pattern. It's really just knits and pearls and then increasing that four places in the pattern. But I love the really geometric line effect you can get with just simple knits and pearls. It really lets the, the yarn speak in the project, but also has enough interest where, yeah, it, it's going to be a really cool shawl. Maybe I'll decide to keep it and I won't let Rumpel still skin. The local yarn store where I work and teach here, maybe it's going to be mine instead of a shop sample. That's all I have to say about that. One more work in progress that I'll show you that's been getting attention. Oh, I guess it's technically a half object. A pair of socks that I'm working on. So this is that yarn, Oxblood, in black market wool. So sadly, she's not currently dying and selling, but I got my hands on some of this exclusive yarn for my birthday last year, actually. She gave me some. I absolutely love this color, and I've been trying to decide what I should make with it. So I brought it with me to Japan, and on my flight back home, I cast on this sock and just improvised this pattern. I created these little, well, it's going to show up, but these little arrows with a little bit of ribbing going down it. Just to give it enough interest and a little bit of snugness to stay on your foot, but also not be so complicated that I would have to turn on my overhead light while I was knitting and disturb the other people on my flight. So I, yeah, I knit a sock on the flight back from my trip, and this is the sock that I've been working on since. Really enjoying it. Not much more to report on that other than I'm knitting them on my 9 inch circulars, high high sharps. I'm actually knitting these on point, uh, 1.5 US. 2.5 millimeters. I'm trying to be better at doing both both sizing on here. Since we're all not stubborn Americans sticking to our own size system. And I think that is everything that I'm going to chat about with you today. Um, unless you want to stick around and hear me ramble on about my trip to Japan. Thank you for checking out the things that I have made in the past month. So my trip to Japan was amazing. If you're from there, if you live there, if you've traveled there or are planning on traveling there, please let me know. Um, Eric and I wanted to go there for so long and I was actually a customer in the store, Bonnie. I was talking to her about how I really wanted to go to Japan, but we just can't really find the time to go since I'm on an academic schedule and summertime it's very, very hot. I don't really like hot. She recommended going in the winter because it's actually the low season and it's always beautiful in Japan. And I'm so happy that she not only told me that but also gave me a ton of recommendations because we had really the trip of a lifetime. Just to, I could ramble on about it forever, but a few quick highlights. Tokyo is amazing. I am not a huge fan of large cities. Visiting New York is fun, but I very quickly get overwhelmed. I was not overwhelmed by Tokyo at all. All of the small neighborhoods, uh, it's just such a beautiful, interesting city filled with delicious food and incredible design. There was just inspiration everywhere you looked in not only Tokyo but everywhere we went. We also went to Kyoto, Osaka, Nara, Hakone. Um, some of my favorite things walking around everywhere were just all of the little gardens that people kept outside. Even in dingy alleyways there were potted plants that were nurtured 
nature is just nurtured everywhere, even in a big city. We did do a few yarny things while we were there. In Tokyo, we visited Walnut, which is the headquarters of one of the best publications ever, Amirisu, and I got to meet the owner while I was there, um, and some other folks, and I got to fangirl very hard. That was a lot of fun. I showed incredible restraint on this trip, facilitated in part by the fact that we traveled very, very light. There just wasn't any space in my suitcase to really buy a lot of stuff. I did get a little bit of fabric in the fabric district and at a tailor in Kyoto. And I plan on showing that off as I work it into projects in the future. I think that's all I have to share. Thank you so much for sticking with me, checking out this podcast. Say hi in the comments below. That's why I love doing this, is connecting with other people who love to make things. And I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.